Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Professor Cordero uh, from the Soci uh, Department of Sociology and Urban Education at City University of New York, the Graduate School and University Center. Prior to joining the Marx School at, at CUNY, Dr. Cordero was a program officer in the Economic Development and the Quality Employment Units of the Asset Building and Community Development Program at the Ford Foundation. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks to uh, board members for the opportunity to, uh, to present uh, here and uh, for the nice setup uh, following Randy's thoughtful passion and Desmond's uh, uh, very measured and well thought out comments. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the relationship between work, poverty, and welfare, which has come up numerous times this morning and before in debates about Puerto Rico. And in spite of significant progress over previous uh, century, Puerto Rico remains a low-income U.S. territory. And in the last decade, we have been losing the fight against poverty. And I'd like to add that I think the fight against poverty is something that we can all kind of join in saying it's something we agree should continue to happen. The incidence and experience of poverty in Puerto Rico varies significantly by age, and children are much more likely to live in poverty compared to persons in older age groups. As the economic crisis in Puerto Rico and the various reports that describe it continue to attract media interest, a number of myths about Puerto Rico's labor supply have gained traction. Uh, the Kruger Report is a good example, as it argues that, uh, and, and I'm not just trying to pinpoint on that report. I think these are arguments that one hears in common discourse in Puerto Rico, and I want to try to address them too. Uh, there's some perception that Puerto Rico has low levels of education, some perception that people in Puerto Rico do not want to work, and there's low labor supply that welfare payments are somehow too generous, that welfare is a disincentive to work and people can get welfare easily, that the minimum wage and labor laws are somehow too generous and, and should be reduced, and that somehow this cocktail or combination of low-wage workers, the poor, and other vulnerable populations are too costly and unproductive and to blame for the financial and economic crisis of Puerto Rico. Uh, let me try to address each of those points as briefly as I can in the 300 seconds I have left. Uh, first, uh, Puerto Rico's made significant gains in education, and uh, um, Randy spoke eloquently about it. And let me just summarize the two or three slides I have on education with one sentence. If there is one major indicator where Puerto Rico and the U.S. have converged over the last century, it's in levels of education. End of story. We can spend the next 20 minutes talking about it, but that's a convergence positive story. Uh, uh, significant progress in education levels and human capital in Puerto Rico, however, have not translated into more secure and stable employment, better pay and better wages, growing incomes, and significantly lower poverty levels for the island. Since 2006, Puerto Rican economy and labor market have collapsed, and you can forward the slide if you'd like, uh, uh, from a peak over 1.4 million persons in the labor force to slightly over 1.1 million in 2017, and the number of employed hovering around less than 1 million workers. So what happened in 2006? Did Puerto Ricans decide one day to the next to change their labor supply behavior? Did they all decide to stop working, join welfare, or migrate at the same time? Uh, no, there was a significant policy change in D.C., uh, which in addition to a U.S. recession, and you can move to the next slide if you'd like, uh, uh, caused and cemented the collapse in the Puerto Rico labor market. This is a labor demand story, not a labor supply story. Whether you are for or against Section 936, whether it's politically convenient or not, it's a fact that the demand for labor in Puerto Rico collapsed. To properly understand and compare labor force participation, and you can uh, move on, those are manufacturing jobs, again, that you can see clearly collapse, and the timing of it is, is, is quite clear. Uh, you can move forward uh, uh, if you'd like. Uh, and you can see the effects of that collapse in all sectors of, of the economy uh, and all segments because of the spillover effects that have been discussed here this morning. Uh, so let me move to the next point about whether welfare benefits in Puerto Rico are too generous, and you can move forward. That's the labor force uh, participation rate in Puerto Rico that clearly collapsed after 2006. Uh, uh, please move forward, um, and please move forward. Next slide, please. Thank you. That, I don't need you to see the numbers. What I want you to see here is the benefit levels in Puerto Rico. One column is the number of months on average that Puerto Ricans on welfare spend, and the next column is uh, the average monthly benefits of, of welfare recipients in Puerto Rico. Uh, you can move to the next slide. I graphed it, and when you graph it, you can see that Puerto Rico is in the low, low quadrant, meaning low average months on welfare and low monthly benefit levels. Welfare payments in Puerto Rico are low compared to other states and the cost of living in Puerto Rico. Next slide, please. Average payments in PAN, the Nutritional Assistance Program, are between $112 and $138 per month. 
and close to 56% of units and 26% of individuals are in one-person units receiving about $138.70 per month. And we all deal with numbers on a regular basis. You tell me whether $138 per month plus uh, some other loose change programs will really add up to an incentive to stay at home overworking. The calculations that purport to show that welfare pays more than work require really Olympic assumptions, including that everyone gets the maximum of every program, and that is just not the case in fact. Uh, uh, PAN is the biggest program at about 1.3 million cases, but TANF, Section 8, and others are much, much smaller. Uh, you need to factor in the probability that the person would get the aid in order for the calculation to be realistic. Uh, uh, yes, if I win the lottery, I'll become a millionaire, but you have to factor in the probability that I'll actually win the lottery. Uh, 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 so programs, as this graph clearly shows, worked as they were supposed to operate. The red line is the collapse in employment. The blue line is the increase in program participation. And what you want from these programs is when the economy collapses, that people take up because they're losing jobs. Uh, uh, so as employment collapsed, caseloads increased and then leveled off and then decreased. So in fact, uh, that's the PAN program where the same relationship obtains. The employment market collapses and you see take up in the program going up at about six month lag. Uh, uh, um, so given, uh, um, next slide, so the, 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 given uh, uh, case, caseloads going down uh, in a time of a, a crisis is actually a puzzle. Why are caseloads going down in the middle of our, our, our recession is something we need to interrogate. So given these declines, I was surprised to see the board's uh, memo on December 20th, uh, the March 9th letter, the 7-30-17 report suggesting converting welfare programs into some kind of earned income tax credit, which again is a different thing. We all for a federally subsidized earned income tax credit, but to tr change the, and tweak with the programs in Puerto Rico requires much more study and much more detailed analysis before uh, jumping into that kind of a proposal, particularly because these income tax credits are contingent upon having earned taxable income. And when there are no jobs, people can't earn uh, taxable income. So if we examine uh, TANF participants, next slide, by, by gender, age, and disability, we realize that there are a very small proportion of the population and almost no able-bodied males. Move to the next slide, please. Which shows that in the entire island of Puerto Rico, there are a total of 640 able-bodied males in the welfare program. I repeat, 640. Puerto Rico has 1.6 million people under poverty. Uh, uh, um, uh, the next slide, please. Uh, uh, PAN is the biggest program uh, and that has many more able-bodied participants, both male and female. And there is, next slide over, an employment status category uh, uh, in the data coded for every case. That's 1.2 million uh, PAN cases. What's their employment status? So in the next slide, I took out all the, the, the children and elderly people and just left the people 18 to 64 years of age. And there are about 560,000 PAN participants that are uh, 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 between 18 and 64. And in the next slide, I classified their employment status into several categories. And keep an eye on the yellow line. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, the single biggest category of employment status of participants in the PAN program is looking for work, 38%. Uh, uh, the next biggest category is working at 14%. Uh, uh, the age category includes people that are younger than 21 years of age and older than 60. Uh, uh, disabled includes people that participate in some kind of substance abuse or a, a treatment program. Family includes people that are taking care of children, that are pregnant, that are taking care of uh, elderly, that are disabled, or children that are disabled. And 41,000 are students and 7%. So uh, 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 participants in the PAM program then are looking for work where there are no jobs, and the jobs that are there don't pay. Puerto Rico already has the lowest wages in the nation, and I just, again, don't need you to see the numbers. I just need you to see where Puerto Rico is located when the wages are uh, 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 arranged from the highest wages to the lowest wages. Puerto Rico is about $9.42, or 56% of the nation's median hourly wage, uh, 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 and, and it's a significant gap. Uh, there's a significant proportion in the next slide of workers in Puerto Rico that are working at the minimum wage. So Puerto Rico, this problem is not that the wages are too high. Uh, Puerto Rico is a low-wage, low-pay economy, and Puerto Rico's main problem, employment problem and challenge is not that wages are too high, but that the wages are too low, and many in the population often have to shift between formal and informal employment, have multiple jobs in order to be able to survive and make ends meet. Areas in Puerto Rico with high wage and salary income in the next uh, uh, slide, uh, uh, the next one over, Areas in Puerto Rico with higher wage and salary income also tend to have higher employment. In the next slide, the observed positive relationship between wages and employment also obtains when we examine data at the state level. 
That's Puerto Rico alone by itself as a low wage, low employment area. And you can see where all the other states are. Uh, the highest the employment level in the state, the higher the, the wages, or the higher the wages, the higher the employment level. Uh, so you can increase Puerto Rico's participation rate by lowering wages, but why send Puerto Rico on its lonely path where there is already a road that is true and tried? Uh, 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 how low do wages have to go in Puerto Rico before they actually go up? And we see an increase in income, standards of living, and employment levels. There's severe inequalities between Puerto Rico and the states where there's also a lot of inequality inside Puerto Rico. And that's something that I haven't heard mentioned. Who takes what is produced on the island? The data show that the bottom 20% in Puerto Rico takes 1% of the income. The bottom 40% takes 9% of the income. The top 20% takes 55% of the income. And the top 5% takes 25% of the income. So you can churn the machine, but if you don't change the machinery inside and how it's going to be distributed, you're going to still going to continue to create a, 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 a serious poverty problem. And the next slide, uh, the push forces collapsing Puerto Rico's economy, low work, low pay, low returns to human capital, cuts in services, uh, 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 and the pool of better wages, better living conditions, and more access to economic opportunity are changing the shrinking Puerto Rico's population. The lower bar by age, from 16 to 65, the red line is how much a person make in, makes in Puerto Rico. The blue line is how much a Puerto Rican makes in the United States. Uh, uh, the average Puerto Rican living in the mainland US is expected to earn about 640,000 more between the ages of 16 and 65 compared to the average Puerto Rican on the island. And guess what, my friends? Lowering the wages on the island and, and decreasing working conditions is just going to increase that gap. When you lower the red bar, you're not doing anything to the blue bar other than increasing the gap for the average Puerto Rican that can see their future and see clearly a, 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 a low-wage economy on the island and opportunity for more earnings with the same human capital uh, uh, on the mainland. Uh, uh, next uh, uh, slide, please. Uh, that's Puerto Rico's population uh, 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 pyramid. And as we can clearly see, uh, 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 the combined effects uh, 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 of, sorry. As people in, uh, live in large numbers, the size and composition of the population in Puerto Rico are also changing dramatically. And next slide over. Uh, that's the ages where Puerto Rico's losing population, and at the top are the ages where Puerto Rico's gaining population. Next slide over. So the UN predicts that Puerto Rico's going to lose population dramatically, and what you have in the lines is what the UN predicts. What you have in the dot is where Puerto Rico actually is. So Puerto Rico's 20 years ahead of, of the most uh, 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 optimistic of the, of the uh, UN uh, scenarios, and the loss of population is dramatically. So let me close by talking about Hurricane Maria, which brought about significant devastation to the local infrastructure. But one of the regular features that we see when storms come in uh, uh, is that three things happen. One, the poorest and most disadvantaged residents are, are more vulnerable. They're exposed to severe consequences in their neighborhoods, their homes, and their bodies. Second, the poor and more disadvantaged get help and sustain resources last. And third, which we need to avoid, is reconstruction efforts treat the poor and the disadvantaged. Uh, as some kind of nuisance, some kind of inconvenience, and some kind of an afterthought. And we need to do better, and the U.S. citizens of Puerto Rico deserve much, much better. And now uh, uh, we see that the future of Puerto Rico is again being decided in D.C. with minimum involvement and consent from the governed and those whose lives will be most affected by these decisions. If there was one week that truly illustrates the dependency and vulnerability of Puerto Rico and that labor demand is what drives the process, this week is it. Uh, you can cut wages, you can cut welfare, you can eliminate labor laws, you can, you can eliminate labor rights, and that will not give you the economic growth that Puerto Rico needs. Puerto Rico needs policies that attack poverty and attack the root causes of poverty. What we know from our research is that the best anti-poverty policy and program is a good job in a thriving economy. So let me be very clear, there is no social science evidence to support the notion that the collapse in Puerto Rico's labor market and the economy, accelerated since 2006, are the result either of the actions of poor people in Puerto Rico or the programs that have been designed to provide some minimal aid and support to the most marginalized segments of the population. Those looking for simple answers or for someone to blame for the crisis need to look elsewhere, perhaps at themselves, when trying to find the causes and culprits of Puerto Rico's economic, social, fiscal, demographic, and political crisis. And I could spend the next 20 minutes uh, giving you some solutions, but I know my time is up. Maybe I'll en entertain them in the Q&A uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hector. Uh, we'll hear. Thank you very much, Mr. Ferrer. Um, 
Now I'll turn to the board members and or government representatives who would want to ask questions to the panelists. We're working. Thank you. Um, well, thank you all for coming today. This is, I think, in, in my view, a very important discussion. It's an important discussion that we have today uh, among ourselves, between ourselves, and also in, in terms of talking to the public. I think we probably agree that, that, that Puerto Rico's labor welfare laws were not co what caused the downturn uh, to the economy and to the government's finances beginning um, you know, in 2008 or so. I, I personally think it's probably the withdrawal of Section 936. I think probably most people agree with that. But I think it's important we look at these issues because even prior to the recent economic downturn, Puerto Rico had much lower labor force participation, much lower incomes, much higher poverty rates than, than the rest of the country. And my concern is that even a well-executed recovery plan from Hurricane Maria, something that repaired the uh, electric grid and the, and the rest of the infrastructure, unless it contains structural reforms to, uh, to improve labor supply, you're likely to end up where, you, where we were before, which is still a country which is, or an island, which is uh, unfortunately very poor and is likely to leave to lose population to the mainland. Um, my, my comments, uh, uh, Professor Cordero, you, you presented a lot, of, a lot of data, which I think is very, very interesting. So I'll, I'll focus a little bit on that, but I certainly I'm open to any other comments and the rest of the panel, because we'll touch on a variety of things. Uh, Professor, one, you, I, I think I, I characterize it, you say the, the problem, uh, certainly for the labor supply in, in, on the island, is not a supply side problem. It's not, your argument, it's not because of labor laws or welfare incentives. And you're saying, nor is it a human capital problem um, in terms of educational qualifications. I think I'll touch in the second, uh, the human capital issue first. Um, you, you made, I think, a convincing case that what you call quantity of education on the island is, is rapidly approaching that on the mainland. Quantity of education means the number of years of schooling that a person has. But quantity of education is not equal to quality of education. And quality of education is a better measure of human capital. That, I think, can be captured a little bit better by thinking about the test scores, comparing Puerto Rico to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Um, I pulled up, uh, if you look at the National Assessment of Ed Educational Progress, math scores, uh, Puerto Rico's, the gap between Puerto Rico and Alabama is twice as large. Alabama's the lowest scoring state in the U.S. The gap between Puerto Rico and Alabama in math scores is twice as large as the gap between Alabama and Massachusetts, which is the highest scoring state. You have an enormous gap on that. And, th and that continues if you look at reading, if you look at different grades. Similarly, if you look at what's called the PISA exam, which is the Program for Inter International Student Assessment, the OECD does that. I looked up data the other day in 125 different countries and regions. Uh, Puerto Rico in reading ranked 106th on uh, math, it ranked 100. 17th. So I think you have a, a, a significant problem that even if the quantity of education is, is matching up reasonably well with, with its competitors, the quality of education is not nearly where it needs to be. I don't know what the problem is. It's probably multiple problems, but I think the government needs to take that extremely seriously. Um, thinking on the supply side incentives, I thought it would be helpful to compare a little bit to Florida which is a state that many Puerto Ricans willingly or unwillingly are becoming very familiar with. Uh, Florida has a labor force participation rate at last check about 60% versus 38% in Puerto Rico. Uh, poverty rate in Florida is about 14% versus 45%. Uh, median income in uh, uh, Florida is two and a half times that of Puerto Rico. I think it's worth looking. Those are outcomes you want to aim for. Those are outcomes that people are leaving Florida to, to aim for. If you think about uh, labor requirements, um, in Puerto Rico, the minimum wage is 70% of the median wage, and in uh, Florida, it's only 40%. You have much higher relative minimum wage. Paid leave, an experienced employee in, in Puerto Rico must be paid up to three weeks pay, zero weeks in Florida. Sick leave, up to two weeks in Puerto Rico, zero weeks in Florida. The Christmas bonus, up to three weeks pay in Puerto Rico, zero weeks in Florida. Maternity leave, up to eight weeks in Puerto Rico, um, zero weeks in Florida. By itself, and this is standard textbooks economics, by itself, the, the, the mandatory paid leave 
in Puerto Rico would reduce wages by around 20% relative to what they would have been without that. In other words, if you applied these same paid leave requirements to Florida, their wages would drop by a similar amount. This is just what Econ will tell you. So I think part of your argument is, well, there's, the wages are not high enough in Puerto Rico, therefore people are not working, but part of the problem is the wages are being depressed by mandatory benefits. Um, in addition, Florida has what's called employment at will, which means you can hire or fire as you like. It makes it less risky to hire an employee. Puerto Rico is one of only oh, 49 of 50 states have employment at will. Puerto Rico lacks that. All of these, in a textbook sense, will reduce labor supply, unequivocally. Light, similarly, I mean, you discussed a little bit about food stamps, receipt. Um, in Florida, food stamps are half as generous relative to median wages as they are in Puerto Rico. Florida, Puerto Rico, unlike all of the 50 states, does uh, not have a work requirement for food stamps. Florida does. Uh, if you're an able-bodied recipient without children, I think you get three months of receipt. After that, you have to be working, training, or um, employed, or uh, volunteering. I guess my question is, looking at all these statistics, is it your position, Professor, mm -hmm. that these policies have no effect on the supply of labor and the incomes that people receive in Puerto Rico? Um, I, I was hoping you would compare Puerto Rico to New York, or that you would compare Puerto Rico to the most progressive state, and what do you think you'll find? If you, here's that, 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 oh, the, sure. that the gap is even bigger, right? Than, than, than what it, than could, it could be with Florida. And is your contention that if you give Puerto Rico all the indicators that you give to Florida, that Puerto Rico's income uh, would go up just as Florida's and that Puerto Rico's poverty rate would go down just as Florida's? It will not. If we, if we, could, if we could magically just okay. make all those tweaks, is that really what's gonna drive uh, growth in Puerto Rico? I, I really don't think so. I mean, I think you know, we, we, we can spend a lot of time on the apples and apples and oranges and oranges. But I think we really run, need to run all these things by like a common sense test at some point. Okay, so my, my question, Professor, is I, obviously there's other things going on in Puerto Rico. Lower human capital through poor education. More uh, bureaucracy I can address for that starting. If you'd like. I'm, just, I'm trying to ask a question. Is it your, is it your view uh -huh. that all the policies that I outlined for Puerto Rico, the requirements of paid leave, no employment at will, uh, Christmas bonus, that that doesn't have any negative effect on labor supply relative to places like Florida? My, 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 first of all, one has to do a kind of empirical work on Puerto Rico looking at those variables, which I don't think you've done, nor have I. But my speculation would be that the effect would be minimal uh, mm -hmm. if, 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 and, 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 and then trivial when you compare uh, the big picture. In other words, what I was just telling you before, that if you make those tweaks, uh, the kind of job growth that you're going to get is not going to be the kind of job growth that's going to lift Puerto Rico's income up and poverty down to the level that those other states have it. And again, we, we can, I think what would be an interesting study would be to compare Puerto Rico to Florida and to various other types of states. And, and Puerto Rico is a lot of path dependent. Uh, remember, I mean, you, you, you can't just look at Puerto Rico today as if it doesn't have a history, if it doesn't have like a particular path. So that's what explains sort of the labor force participation rate. It's always been lower in the mainland. There was a point in time in sugarcane production, which was another example of U.S.-driven economic development for Puerto Rico, right? Whatever the U.S. needs, Puerto Rico does. Uh, that, that work was seasonal. Uh, so yes, there have been times in which the Puerto Rico labor supply uh, has adjusted to the labor demand. What I'm telling you is that labor demand is what drives the process, not labor supply. That, that, that we're here not because Puerto Ricans don't desire or want to work. There's 175,000 people in Puerto Rico today working for below minimum, uh, not for below minimum, for below poverty wages. There's uh, about 125,000 or more unemployed looking for work. There, I just show you there's 200,000 just in the PAN program alone. That, uh, and, and again, first, we don't have the data. And we say, well, uh, uh, we speculate that people in PAN don't want to work. And then when I show the data, people say, well, I don't believe the data. We've got to kind of make up your mind at some point. Well, and I, say, did, I, 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 I say whether we, whether, whether we so, and, and what it shows is, again, that the people are looking for work. They're just not finding it. And, and, and you can have a person look for one week, two weeks, three weeks, if there's not an employer on the other side uh, uh, to, to, to bargain, they're gonna, have, they're gonna go. Uh, now on the quality of education, first we were discussing the issue of quantity of education, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and uh, the first census of uh, the US in Puerto Rico found that 80% of the people didn't know how to read or write. Puerto Rico's made a humongous amount of progress. Mm -hmm. Now I've seen the Fed study and other studies that look at test scores in Puerto Rico, and, and you have to look at first the test itself, and second, you have to look at the production function of the test score. 
right? So if you have a, a place that has a much higher poverty rate, and you know poverty impacts a test score, you would expect a place with a higher poverty rate to have a higher test score, everything else being the same, just because that's the way it works. So it's economics affects results of test scores, independent and above and beyond the effects of teachers, the effects of classrooms, and those are you know, interesting. Uh, uh, there's a lot of research on, on that, that on, on the effects of socioeconomic background on educational attainment scores. So you're taking a, a, poverty, a place that has a poverty rate of 46%, where 56% of the children are poor, and you're saying, here's Alabama over here. How does, how does that explain the, the, the international comparisons to countries that are far poorer than Puerto Rico, countries that spend less in their schools in Puerto um, Rico? Um, I don't think those countries end up testing the same proportion of the population that Puerto Rico tests. There are issues of, are you including everybody in those countries in the test? And Puerto yeah. Rico has a lot of, uh, it's, it's a very inclusive system. Everybody's going to get tested. I don't know that, that in some other those countries around the world, uh, you're going to really have the same proportion of children uh, that are being tested. So, of course, if you compare the kids that are more likely to test in those countries, which tend to be the kids from the higher socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, so you have to clean all those things up if we want to make real uh, apples to apples kinds of comparisons. Okay. I mean, I'll, end, I'll end with unfair. this. I'll say my reaction to this panel, unfortunately, is similar to my reaction to the previous one. There's, there's worthwhile stuff being said, uh -huh. but it is the sort of thing saying we just need more spending, more investment, more stimulus. And Puerto Rico's had a lot of fiscal stimulus. When the government borrows until it can't spend anymore, that's a lot of stimulus. If we don't start thinking about deeper problems, thinking outside the box, 20 years from now, we'll be having the same conversation that we're having this morning. I completely I agree with you. I this panel, I think it for this for I the completely agree with you. And if we uh, have a headache and we get our foot amputated, we're not going to solve our headache, right? So I'm helping you trying to have the proper, <laughs> the proper diagnosis of the problem. And the proper diagnosis of the problem is that Puerto Rico's problem in terms of the labor market and the labor force is not Puerto Ricans' desire to work. Well, is, then, is, the, is the absence of employment opportunity. <laughs> There's no question of that. They, they, well, well they, no, 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 but, 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 but the sophisticated just... language of labor supply underneath it is an argument about people's desirability or desire yeah, to work and the incentive structure and whether the incentive structure is aligned. But let's align the incentive structure. Why, rather than saying let's cut benefits, we don't say let's increase the minimum wage, let's increase the benefits, let's pump some money into that economy, <laughs> and that's really what's going to end up growing it, right? Aye. Well, again, you know, we can, we can, we can have a, 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 a disagreement and we can look at data. And I think ultimately we should solve this based on well, data, Puerto Rico not based has one on one of the highest relative ideology. minimum wages in the world. Knock yourself out. I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry if I sound a little frustrated, but th this, is, this is an important issue. It's a really, yeah, really higher important Higher wages issue. is going to make Puerto Rico, if you increase the minimum wage in Puerto Rico, you're going to have uh, an effect of more people working because they're going to find it even more attractive. Because Puerto uh, Rico. And, 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 and if, and if, and, but, but wait a minute. If you increase, if you, if you get like a federal uh, uh, subsidy on the wage, for example, a temporary federal subsidy on the wage, it's going to make a difference whether oh, Sobrino can, whether Sobrino can get them to buy a Padrino of, of Pepsi or whether they can get to buy some Mavi and some, and some empanada, right? So yes, we also have a machinery problem. We need to pump money into the economy, and we need to re-engineer the economy so that consumers in Puerto Rico consume the money more in Puerto Rico, and that's going to get us some growth. But going after people's pockets, going after workers' pockets, is not going to get you the kind of growth that I think you're looking for, if you're looking for growth. I hope you're right. I suspect not. Eh, bueno, voy a seguir como, uh, como Cristian en español, este, debido a que todos los que, están, los que estamos, en, los, todos los ponentes, de ponentes este, hablan español, me parece, ¿no? Eh, este, número uno, gracias por estar con nosotros hoy y por sus recomendaciones específicas, sobre todo, como, por ejemplo, ven, viendo las oportunidades que usted eh, enumeró en términos de diferentes lugares donde se pueden cambiar cosas y donde se pueden lograr ahorros. Este... Eh, varios hablaron sobre dónde estaba la cantidad de, de, de empleos públicos antes y dónde estábamos ahora y dónde estábamos en términos de salarios y dónde estamos ahora. Sería bien útil si nos pueden enviar más información específica sobre ello eh, para entender cuando ha bajado la población, cómo han cambiado los diferentes empleos y cuál es la data que usted debe, piensa que debemos de tomar en consideración para entender cuánto se ha, ha habido de recortes o no ha habido de recortes en términos de entender esa base, sería bien útil, eh, sobre todo se lo pido al, eh, al señor Pagán, a, a usted, el señor Figueroa, y a usted también, perdón, que no, no cogí su apellido. Ok, pues muchas gracias. Sería bien útil si nos podría enviar. Entonces, eh, eh, yo creo que varios, varias personas hablaron de la importancia de la ayuda económica que proveería eh, el Congreso, si lo provee, 
en términos de la transformación de Puerto Rico. Y sería útil entender qué, qué cambios ustedes piensan. O sea, ese issue que usted este, menciona, señor uh, Pagan, en términos de eh, que, que tal vez eso es dinero que entra a Puerto Rico y sale de Puerto Rico. Si se compra un producto que sea más caro o más barato, si no es un producto puertorriqueño, este, eh, ese dinero no necesariamente se queda en la comida puertorriqueña. Este, algunos cambios, eh, reformas, cosas que ustedes piensen que se deben de tomar en consideración que ayudaría a que, eh, que la reconstrucción sea una reconstrucción para mejoría y para mejor crecimiento económico. Porque si entran chavos y salen chavos y no hay cambio y no, y no mejoran la, las cosas, no, no vamos a lograr eh, el crear oportunidades en Puerto Rico para, para el futuro, que yo creo que es parte de lo que todo el mundo tiene de encomienda y de, y de interés. Así que nada, eh, solo le pido recomendaciones específicas en esas áreas. Ahora, luego, eh, cuando sea, serían bien útiles porque... Eh, o sea, me parece que las cosas no son 100% de una manera ni 100% de la otra. Este, eh, y, y si aquí, si Dios quiere, tenemos una oportunidad de reinventar y de, y de, y de mejorar. Eh, este, pero cómo aseguramos que las inversiones sean inversiones, que sean inversiones transformativas y no eh, reconstruir cosas que tal vez no están, no están funcionando para nuestro futuro. Dada la estructura de ingresos de impuestos como ha evolucionado en Puerto Rico, las la, la clases populares en Puerto Rico pagan una porción bien alta de su ingreso en impuestos. O sea que yo creo que por los impuestos de consumo y todo eso. Entonces yo creo que es extremadamente importante que busquemos formas inmediatas de darle más dinero a esas familias más necesitadas. A esos efectos hay canales existentes y canales no existentes que tienen que crearse. Empecemos por los canales existentes. Existe el programa PAN y existe el programa TANEF. El programa PAN es un programa de asistencia nutricional. Se puede aumentar el nivel de ingreso que se requiere para cualificar en el programa y se puede aumentar la cantidad de dinero que se da en el programa. Y eso añade dinero inmediatamente a las familias más necesitadas. A su bolsillo de un día para otro. Eso sería cambio en ley federal, ¿no? Porque Puerto Rico tiene un... Habría que, correcto, habría que, que, que enmendar, pero ese es en parte el punto. Puerto Rico tiene un nivel de pobreza de 46 y pico por ciento y la indumentaria y el aparato del Estado, todo con CAPS y todo con... No tiene la herramienta para pelear la pobreza como tienen otros estados, porque las herramientas están atadas a ciertos CAPS federales. El programa TANEF ahora mismo tiene dos programas. El programa que se llama Aid uh, uh, to Blind, Elderly and Disabled, que era el programa viejo, que todavía está a la mitad del TANIF, la otra mitad son las, las madres solteras con niños pequeños. ¿verdad? Hay que crear un programa de SSI en Puerto Rico, saca a esas familias del TANIF y dale un dinero de SSI. Hay, tiene que haber paridad en todos los programas. Esos CAPS no, no ayudan y no le dan dinero a, la, a los consumidores. Nada, con cuestiones adicionales, se ha hablado mucho del EITC, un EITC federal, un crédito federal a, 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 al, al trabajo, aunque la gente en Puerto Rico no rinde planillas federales, sí se podría hacer un cálculo de un tipo de subsidio. Número dos, quizás un subsidio temporero de salarios que, que, que apoye a, a esos empleadores que, que se les hace tan difícil contratar a trabajadores por esos costos, pues vamos a subsidiar esos costos. Tercero, independientemente de lo que uno esté a favor o en contra del John Sack, si es un costo para Puerto Rico, ese costo puede ser eh, eh, reembolsado eh, de cierta forma. No sé por qué la isla tiene que disproporcionadamente cargar con todo el peso de, de esa política. Pero estoy de acuerdo totalmente que podemos hacer todas esas cosas y puede que no haya el crecimiento económico necesario porque la maquinaria misma de esa economía está eh, des, eh, desorganizada. Puerto Rico siempre se ha dicho que produce lo que no consume y consume lo que no produce. Y ese tipo de, de, de desencaje eh, crea unos líquidos inmensos en esa economía y hay que buscar una forma de capturar eh, más de esa actividad económica y que se quede circulando dentro de la isla. Y yo sé que eso es un reto del cual no hay soluciones este, inmediatas y fáciles, pero hay que empezar resolviendo el problema de más dinero en la economía y que la gente pobre no, no pase hambre. Y, y, y eso es un problema hoy en día en Puerto Rico todavía. Y, y una de las cosas cuando hablamos de, de austeridad que tenemos que tomar en consideración es que Puerto Rico no controla su... O sea, no con, control its own currency. No, no, eh, la ley no provee acceso a, a cash. O sea, que, que parte, parte de... O sea, eh, y es bueno escuchar sus, recom sus recomendaciones en términos de cambios a nivel federal, pero sería útil también luego, tal vez después, cuáles son los cambios que se puede hacer a nivel de Puerto Rico en parte de transformación que, que usted piensa que ayudaría a la economía. Así que nada, gracias y continuaremos la conversación. En nuestra ponencia están eh, como anejo eh, los estudios de productividad y, y todo lo que conlleva la situación de la autoridad. Gracias. 
Okay. Uh, thanks uh, to the panelists. I'd, I'd ask if you could stay because uh, we'll hear some questions from here. Yeah. Yeah. From the from the public.